I want to do a, a little bit of a recap because uh, I gave this class, I think, back in the a class back in August. Uh, and Rich recognizes the value of a leecap after one week. So I think after you know a few months of taking a little bit of a, a recap would be um, helpful. So because, but then we'll we'll expand uh, from from beyond uh, what we did that that time. So just a couple things. We'll be focusing in on 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 the name of God, which he initially or initially calls Ehye Asher Ehye, and um, which is translated "I am that I am" or "I will be uh, what I will be." Um, but keep in mind that you know this is. Uh, this is really God's name. So we we think of God sometimes as a name, um, but remember that that's more of a title uh, or a job description that God has um, that comes from the Hebrew word Elohim, and, and it's the which is the you know the title for a for a divine being. But His name is is Yahweh, which was a name and is a name worthy of honor and respect, and that name. Uh, was was revealed in a special way to Moses at, at the burning bush. And God explained and introduced his name uh, to Moses because, or in a way that, I mean, we see that divine name showing up early in, in Genesis uh, 2 and and in the words of of. of People like you know Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but yeah. but here in in Exodus three we have this explanation that God gives that is really really powerful, uh, and it's it, we could read it as I will be who I will be, um, or I am who I am, and it's and, it, and in some ways it's kind of an enigma. It's like God is almost saying like I'm undefinable. Uh, I can't really be described simply. Um, so I'm going to give you this uh, almost um, con confusing, enigmatic name that that only hints at, at at the reality of of his being and his greatness uh, and his and his ability to bring things uh, into being. This is the God who created the universe. Um. Now, the thing to understand as well is that to 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 recap that 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 there's a connection between God's telling Moses, "Ehye uh, Asher Ehye, I will be who I will be," and the name that He gives a little bit later in in verse fifteen. When he said, say to the people of Israel, the Lord, in our English versions, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. That word Lord is the more common divine name that we, uh, that we read all throughout the Bible over and over again. And we, when you see it in all caps like that, remember that's the, the reminder that that's really uh, not even a translation of, uh, for the for the name Yahweh, it's it's really just a substitution, because the uh, it's partly to to out of reverence and respect for God's name. Many thought that they it should not be said. The Jews Jews vowel pointed uh, this name with vowel pointings for Adonai, which means Lord, and so most English translators kind of followed suit and and translate it or or represent the name uh, as the Lord. But the Lord, uh, but Yahweh, which uh, at least an attempt to 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 pronounce the name I and mean, the true the true pronunciation, I would submit is is probably pretty hard to to be confident about. There's there's many opinions on 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 that. But the I think more important than pronunciation is is the fact that the meaning of that name actually is is connected to uh the I will be concept because this is simply the third person description of God's name because it wouldn't make sense for Moses to say 
uh, I will be has sent me uh, or to, to regularly talk about God that way because it would sound almost like Moses is calling himself God. Instead, the third person, he will be, is really what Yahweh is communicating. Um, so that was the reason why it kind of switches from tell them, Ehyeh has sent me to you, and then later he says, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, or Yahweh, the God of your fathers, uh, has sent me to you. So it's the it's just a kind of a conversion of the name uh, to be in the third person to, to communicate that idea uh, better. So um, we talked about, yeah, so here is a little chart to kind of you know, visualize that, like A is I am and I will be, uh, while uh, Yehie is the Hebrew word for he is and he will be. But just a slight change in that a an older synonym for for haya, uh, which would be conjugated yihye to be he will be, is um, he vav he, and that's where um, yud he vav he Yahweh comes from. So it's synonymous with uh, he will be. And we've mentioned that there's that this uh, well. So related to that, the the, the phrase ehie um, as I will be, uh, and well, yeah. So here, here I'll, I'll spell it out and show you. Uh, Yehie is he will be, and then uh, Yahweh is really uh, another alternate way of saying he will be. So that's a, those are the basics uh, about some some things that we can gather from God's name, knowing a little bit of Hebrew uh, and reading uh, others' explanations of the name. But the interesting thing that that hit me about nine months ago or, or so or was reading this passage uh, during a Wednesday night Bible class, following along in Hebrew, that in verse 12, there was... A, a revelation when that that kind of pops off the page when you read it in Hebrew, uh, when God said to Moses in response, well, in, in verse eleven, Mo Moses says to God, "Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt?" And He said, "But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain." So that statement, I will be with you, uh, uses that same word, ehie, just two verses earlier than where God reveals his name. So I think you know, we were, we're taught uh, as young people and reminded again and again that context is really, really important to understand scripture. And I think there's importance here in the context to try to understand God's name because God is saying to Moses just two verses earlier, Ehye, but he says, uh, Ehye imach, I will be with you. And if to me that that made me think about, well, this is is this really part of what God's message is when he gave Moses his name and said, Ehye Asher Ehye? Was he hinting back to what he had said just just uh, moments earlier that I will be with you when you go to Pharaoh? Um, so I started thinking about it. I think, well, maybe I'm just making a lot out of a, out of out of a very common word. Uh, maybe it can't be that significant. Um, but part of what we we don't realize at first probably is that the the the, the phrase "I am." Uh, in Hebrew is often uh, a different way. It comes across, it comes, it comes to our English in, from a different way than, than the word ehye. Because pretty much any verb that's put in, uh, in an imperfect tense will kind of get the helping verb uh, will be or, I, or am along with the verb. And it's really built into the verb 
So you don't use the typical the Hebrew word uh, to be, which is in your upper uh, left corner there, haya. Um, so there's that, but nevertheless, haya is still a very common word. If you look up in Strong's um, you know, Concordance, you'll see that it's you know used over 30, 3,500 times um, in its different forms. But when you do a search for the particular conjugation, which you can't do with a strong concordance, but with, with a computer search in the Hebrew, you see that actually the I will be form, eh, yeah, is much, much more uncommon. Only 55 times in the entire Bible, only about once per book in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and here in Exodus 3, we have it four times in just a couple of ver- three verses or three, four verses. So that to me said, well, I think they really are supposed to be linked. And looking further, digging in into it a little bit further and looking at some of those other 55 references, actually most of those 55 references are used by God. So it's almost as if in, in, the, in the Hebrew text of the Bible that, that that word is kind of treated with reverence. And majority of the time is used by God. Now, I, that's maybe overstating it a little bit because it's, you know, other people use it like David and, and, and others. But the fact that, well, all of the Torah and the first five books of Moses and all of Joshua, the only time you see Ehye is referring to God. So there seems to be almost uh, in Moses' writings and, and, and a little bit beyond a res- reserving of that word for for our Heavenly Father. But even more remarkable is the way that that word is used in the in the Torah and in uh, in um, Joshua and and even into Judges. Every time, other than the introduction of the name Ehye Asher Ehye, and to say he has sent you every other time it mirrors what was said in exodus 3 12 i will be with you so god's always saying it using the word and again and again and again he's giving the message i will be with you for example to isaac he said sojourn in the land and i will be with you and i will bless you uh to you and your offspring i will give these lands and i will establish the oath that i swore to abraham your father he says it to Jacob. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of the fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. He says it again. Um, he said it to, we said in to Moses, two verses before he declares the name, I will be with you when Moses had his reservations. Um, and a chapter later, God says it to Moses again. But he says a slightly different way, instead of just, I will be with you, it's, I will be with your mouth. When Moses said, I'm slow of speech and heavy of tongue, um, you know, please send somebody else. And God said, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. So God promised him he would be with him. And he again said it, you shall speak to him and put the words uh, in his mouth into Aaron's mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach both of you what to do. So God is promising again and again and again, I will be with you. And here he's saying the same message you know, in terms of I will be with you in guiding and helping you in what, what you're going to say. Uh, he says it to Joshua. Uh, that I will be with you. Well, Moses, uh, let's see. No, I'm sorry. Um, the Lord commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give to them. I will be with you. So he said it to Moses or to Joshua. He said it to Gideon. Uh, the, the, and, and it's in the prophets as well. Again and again and again, we hear this promise, I will be with you. So, um, there's Joshua. Um, God says, repeats it again in Joshua chapter one, and and he says it in Joshua three is and Joshua six. So again and again and again, we have God 
giving the message, I will be with you. And he uses this word, Ahiyah. And it's the same word he used as his name. And and Yahweh is a form of this word. So in, in our community, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about the memorial name and, and the meaning that uh, it's putting together uh, that with uh, Elohim and saying it, it means uh, I will be mighty ones and it's about God manifestation and, and, and so on, which goes back to, to Dr. Thomas. But I, when I saw this, I started to think, you know, I really think that, you know, there, there could be an application there. I, I really should study that a little bit more to draw a firm conclusion one way or the other. But but I have a, uh, yeah, um, to Gideon, yeah. So anyway, when coming across all of these, these verses, it, it to me said, you know, this I think is the primary meaning of God's name based on the context and based on the fact that again and again and again, the message is being repeated, I will be with you. And and think about where this was happening. God was speaking to Moses at the burning bush, which was not consumed. And, and that's actually, there's a whole other study that I've uh, begun that links. There's, there's a bunch of linkages between this passage in Exodus 3, which where Moses came with the flock to the mountain of God. Well, the last time fire was mentioned was when uh, Abraham was journeying to the mountain of Yahweh, the mountain of God's name. And that's in, in Genesis uh, 22. And fire is mentioned, that's the last time fire is mentioned until here in Exodus 3. So if you're reading through the Torah and here you come across fire, the, the last time you would have encountered that word fire is in the, the journey of Abraham and Isaac for Isaac to be sacrificed. And, and the message there was that the fire was in Abraham's hand. It was in the father's hand. And if you think about the, the symbolism and the type of of Abraham and Isaac walking together towards Isaac's sacrifice, it mirrors and, and foreshadows God being with Jesus as Jesus ascends to uh, Calvary for his, for his sacrifice. And I think Jesus would have seen the message there, the reminder there that God is with me in this most difficult of trials. And I can have trust just like Abraham was there walking beside the, the message again and again, uh, is is mentioned in Genesis 22. The two of them went up together. God would have, or Jesus. I think God saw to it that Jesus had that comfort, seeing that He, God, was going to be with Jesus, and Jesus wasn't walking alone. All forsook Him and fled. Yes, but God was there by His side, uh, and and the fire was in the Father's hand. So the trial. God was in control. It's like what Paul says, uh, that God is working for good. Uh, for, all, for, for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. God was working good, even though incredible suffering was going to happen. The fire was there, the, but it would not consume Jesus. Uh, and, and the lesson you know, carries through forward to as well to you know, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, the three friends of Daniel who go into the fiery furnace. And what's there again is the reminder God was with them. There was a fourth one in the fire, one who looked like uh, a son of the gods, uh, but in, in coming from the mouth uh, of one of the Babylonians. But but that but that phrase could be translated just as easily one like the son of god so they were fellowshipping the son of god in their sufferings in the fiery furnace and they were not harmed eternally the trials we go through we are not harmed all things work for good because god is with us so i mentioned that i had some apprehension um about you know when i first saw it am i this is because i know i'm treading on holy ground 
uh, the meaning of God's name, uh, you know, thinking and considering it. And I never heard anybody teach that that connection or that possible meaning before. So I, I wondered, was I just reading into things? Well, I mentioned that you know the whole of Torah uses Ehia uh, as saying God is with uh, God is with you again and again and again and and beyond. So I felt a little more safe after after seeing that. Uh, but since then, since I since I gave the class on the subject, uh, I stumbled upon uh, a video by uh, one of my favorite podcasters, uh, a rabbi by the name of David Foreman. Uh, he's the one who I mentioned before who gave the ideas that I shared uh, one or two classes ago about the three signs that Moses gave to Pharaoh, uh, also from this burning bush narrative. And when I, and, and if you think about it, that, that, that image of God giving Moses those signs from, from that last class, remember that God was choosing not just magic tricks, but particular signs that were to show the children of Israel that God was with them. He saw the suffering that they were going through. He knows the suffering, and he was willing to call out the lies that were being told uh, about them and show the truth as he uh, in in the the images of those signs. So anyway, as I was saying, I stumbled across uh, Rabbi Foreman talking about God's name and the, uh, being revealed at the burning bush. And it was in the context of reflection, reflecting on the October 7th attacks in Israel. So Foreman is from uh, New York, but he was in Israel at the time of the, of the attacks. And it was clear that the trauma of that event has has made an impact on him. And many of the pot, or maybe all the podcasts and videos since then, have been really a response and reflection about what was happening. Or I should say, many, probably not all. So, what I wanted to do is take a minute and share um, that a, a a clip or portion. I guess there's two videos, but I'll just show you the first one if we take like 15 minutes to do that. Um, I have to do a little bit of screen share swapping here. I tested this out and it seemed to work. So we'll see if I can continue making it work yet one more time. Um, so boom. And you'll have to let me know if, give me a shout if the sound doesn't work, but I think should be able to make it work. Screen share. Boom. Share. And then. These massacres. That's not really the point that I wanted to focus on. Whoops. All right. So just after that quick start there, uh, can, can anybody confirm for me that you guys can see in here? Yeah. We can we can we can see it if you could turn it up maybe a little bit, but we right, can hear it as well. It. All right. Hey folks, I'm back with Emu. Um, we wanted you to take a look at another video here too to kind of get some context or some sort of spiritual hand grip of how to deal with uh, times like these that we're in in the aftermath of the um, Hamas terrorist massacre of October 7th of Simcha's Torah uh, this past year. Um, and this is a Parsha video that we put together in Parsha Shemot, um, which talks about um, the declaration that God makes of the burning bush. In the story of the burning bush, um, one of the things that happens is that Moshe asks God's name, and God gives this very puzzling reply. The reply is... Oops, forgive me. Uh, yeah, sure, uh, yeah, which isn't easy to translate. Often it's translated as I am that which I am. Sometimes I will be that which I will be. On the face of it, God's just saying, look, I'm undefinable. Um, I'm only definable in terms of myself. The definition of a definition is that if I try to define something, you can't use the word you're trying to define 
uh, in your explanation of the word. So when God says, I am that which I am, he's basically saying there's nothing in your experience that you can reach to when trying to figure out who I am. I'm utterly unique. And that's a simple way of understanding I am that I am. But what you'll see in this video is a, um, a, a beautiful piece uh, from Rashi quoting the, the sages on a Midrashic understanding of I am that which I am, almost as if the sages took that idea in Pshat, which is that God is utterly unique. And uh, So let me do a little translation. Uh, when he mentions, takes that verse in Pshat, um, typically when uh, Jews interpret scripture, they they do it on two levels. They'll do a, a, a Peshat, which means like the simple level, the simple interpretation, but then something called a Drash or a Midrash trying to inquire deeper into the text to try to see what kind of uh, deeper meanings might be there. So, um, and the, um, also mentioned, uh, so, so he's mentioning Rashi. So, the fact that this is something that goes back quite a ways, uh, and 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 Rashi is quoting earlier uh, scholars, and so this is something that uh, not something that I'm the first to discover by any means, and others have meditated on it and have come up with uh, even more powerful messages, and that's partly why I wanted to share this with you because uh, it's an even deeper meaning can be can be can, can conveyed when you when you think of both that simple meaning of the enigma of God's name, I will be who I will be. You know, what is that? It, you know, it's undefinable in a sense who God is. Uh, a name can't even capture just how immense and powerful, all powerful God is. But also uh, we'll see that if you combine that with the, with the I will be with you message, it, it's like even more powerful. So I'll mention one other thing that, so Rashi will, and maybe the earlier sages to do a little bit of imagining a conversation between Moses and God. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with like kind of putting too much weight into, into, into that, but the message is clearly there. I think even, even without that aspect of it, but, but give it a listen gave their own spin on the nature of that uniqueness, how it is that God is different from humans. This video talks about the question, sort of philosophical question of whether God has emotions, whether he doesn't have emotions, how God relates to other, other people, other uh, creatures in this earth in terms of the question of emotions. It's an interesting philosophical question that for the purposes of now, um, Sort of spiritually grappling with what's going on in the aftermath of, of this of these kidnappings and these these massacres that's not really the point that i want you to focus on but watch this video um and in particular this point about Ahiyash or Ahiyah, how rashi understands it how chazal understand it how it plays off of the uniqueness of god and um god being undefinable in human terms that i think has something to speak to us about this time. And uh, Imu, you know, let's come back and and let people take a look at this and, and talk about at least what it means to us and we can hear the comments yeah, that one. If I may, I'll add one more thing before we, we go, which is like, uh, to me, what's what's surprising about why are we watching a burning bush video? Um, what, what would that have anything to do with um, the, the current conflict that and the current tragedy that we're facing? And I think it's just important to recognize that burning bush is the grand intervention when our people were suffering in Egypt. There, there was a grand national crisis that was, um, you know, a, a, an oppressor doing violence to our people. Um, and there was a moment where God himself chooses to see and hear the, the terrible anguish and suffering. Um, and that moment where things uh, are about to change for the people of Israel is that burning bush moment. That's that's all I really want to say in saying it, before I, I let you go and experience this video is is to remember that there was another time uh, of uh, God talking to us uh, after uh, in, in responding to great communal catastrophe. So uh, just a quick one on that, like, so I talked about how the context 
helps us understand, uh, you know, God's name, but uh, Emu is mentioning the context, the actual situational context of, of when God is talking to Moses here as well. This situation is God has is is seen the suffering and was about to intervene. So that's very, very important when we think about the message as well. Yep. I'll, I'll take that too. So let's let folks watch this and, and we'll come back and, and kind of process it. See you at the end of the video. I want to consider a philosophical puzzle with you. Does God have emotions? One of the things that great thinkers like Maimonides have always said about God is that God is not comprehensible. We can say nothing about the essence of God. We can describe how God acts with us, Maimonides says, but we can't talk about who he is in his essence because his essence is utterly beyond us, which means also that any traits that we talk about, any human traits, we can't really expect those to apply to God. Human traits, human feelings are human feelings. They're not God feelings. So we might well conclude, you know, God doesn't have emotions. But here's the problem. Are you comfortable worshiping a being that cannot experience love? Love is an emotion. Compassion is an emotion. Are we really comfortable with just saying that God acts compassionately, acts as if he loves us, but that the feeling of love and compassion is utterly alien to God? What if you felt that your mother acted lovingly towards you, but didn't feel any love in her heart? It wouldn't feel so good. Is that the way you're supposed to feel about God? So this is the puzzle that I want to talk with you about today, and I want to talk with you about it through the lens of a fascinating Midrashic statement. In this week's parsha, Moshe asks God what his name is. Ehyeh asher ehyeh, he says. I will be that which I will be. And then God adds something else. Tell them that I will be sent you to them. Before we even get to the Midrashic analysis of these words, let's spend a few moments just talking about the pshat, the simple meaning of what's going on here. What would you say the simplest, most basic understanding of this conversation between God and Moses is? What did God mean when he said, I will be that which I will be? You know, the simple understanding pretty much is God says, look, leave me alone. I'm not going to tell you my name. I am what I am. I'm going to be what I'm going to be. I'm the one who just is. And to explain that, just think a little bit about what it is that we mean when we ask for the name of something. We're trying to come to grips with it, to define it somehow. And if someone defines themselves in terms of themselves, they're actually sort of breaking the very first rule of definitions, which is you never define something in terms of itself. You can't say, what's the color purple? Oh, the color purple is sort of purplish. Proper way to define something like the color purple is, well, you take a little bit of red, you take a little bit of blue, mix it together, and you get a purple. If you actually choose to define something in terms of itself, what you're really saying is that you can't just throw together two or three other concepts and make this new concept. The thing itself is utterly unique, which is what God's saying about himself. There is nothing in your world that can explain me. I'm not from your world the maker of the world. You want to know who I am? I'll be what I'll be. The only thing you really know about me is that I exist. Tell them I will be sent you. You can almost hear the exclamation mark at the end of I will be. I shall be. My existence, as inscrutable as it may be, is the basis of it all. Everything comes from my being. So something like that is what probably the plain meaning of the text is. But the rabbis had a midrashic interpretation. They pick up on the fact that God first says, eh, yeah, sure, eh, yeah, I will be that which I will be. And then after that says, tell them I will be. They focus on that discrepancy and they suggest there was a kind of dialogue going on here between God and Moshe. First, God said, eh, yeah, sure, eh, yeah, in answer to Moshe's question, I will be that which I will be. But then the rabbi suggests Moshe objected to that. And in response to that objection, God relented and just said, okay, tell them I will be sent you to them. What was this debate between God and Moshe about? Well, the rabbis impute a whole new understanding to what I will be, that which I will be means. I'm quoting Rashi now. Ehye asher ehye means ehye iman betzarazot asher ehye iman b'shibut sharma. My name? You want to know my name? The one who is with them right now during their times of trouble? That's the one who will always be with them in all their times of trouble for thousands and thousands of years. That's Ehyeh I will be that which I will be. Now to that, Moshe objected. 
Omar Lafarov, he said, Ribona Shalom, master of the universe. Ma'ani Matskalahem Sarah Harris. What do you want me to tell them about future troubles? Dayam Batsarazu, they have enough on their minds right now with this trouble that they're in in Egypt. Omar Lo, to that God said, Yata Marta, you're saying good, Moshe, you're absolutely right. Kota Marley, so I'll just tell them, eh, yeah. Tell them the one who will be with them right now, that's my name, can leave out the rest. Now, what the rabbis are saying is a little bit puzzling. There's this dialogue between God and Moshe. God says something, and then supposedly Moses objects. Where do the rabbis get this idea from at all? How do they know to interpret the words, I will be that which I will be, in such a particular kind of way? The one who will be with them now in their time of trouble will always be with them. It's a very interesting interpretation that just seems to come out of the air. Where are they getting this from? It turns out that there was a clue that suggested this particular interpretation. The clue is the word eh, I am, or I will be. This is not the first time it's used by God in this conversation of the living flesh. All the sages were doing was asking us to look at how God used it earlier in order to understand how God is using it now. So it turns out that earlier in the conversation, Moshe had said to God, Mi anelfi, who am I, ki paro, that I should go to Pharaoh? I totally cannot do this. What was God's response? Vayomer, ki because I will be with you. God understood that Moshe felt in battle. How is he going to go stand before Pharaoh and get the Jews out of Egypt? He can't do that alone. God says, you won't be alone. Ki I'm going to be with you the whole time. So all the sages are saying is that the next time God is using these words, eh, yeah, he means the same thing. Moshe, you felt yourself to be in a time of trouble. Listen to how I reassured you. I told you it's going to be okay. I will be with you. You're never alone in your times of trouble. I'm with you. Now you want to know what to tell the embattled people of Israel. Tell them the same thing. I wasn't just there for one individual, you, Moshe. I'll be there for them. I'm with them in their times of trouble, now and always. And now think about how this interpretation relates back to the simple meaning of the text. I have often talked about the relationship between Medrash and the simple meaning of the text as kind of like the relationship between harmony and melody. The simple meaning of the text is like melody. The Medrash is kind of like harmony. You listen to harmony on its own, it doesn't seem to make that much sense. But you listen to it in connection to the melody, it's playing off the melody in all sorts of intriguing ways. Here, what was the melody? What was the simple meaning of the text? God was saying to Moshe, I'm the master of the universe and you're a human being. You want to know who I am? You can't know who I am. I'm utterly inscrutable. What's the harmony? The harmony is a mirror image of this. What I can give you is the most familiar thing in the world, the most human thing in the world. I can give you empathy. I can be there with you in your times of trouble. The unknowable being can give you the most human, the most familiar thing of all, can give you love. But you know what the sages say? There's another strain in the harmony too. There's actually something about God's love that is so deep that it's actually unknowable. The plain meaning of eh, yeah, sure, eh, yeah, that I am unknowable. The trash is I am unknowable too. There's something about my love that's unknowable. Think about the conversation that's such a thing between God and God. God spoke of a love so vast that the people couldn't comprehend it. I will always be with them, now and forever, in every one of these troubles. Moshe represents the human point of view. They're frail human beings. They can't absorb all of that in their mind. God says, I know. What I just told you is the absolute truth. You tell them what they can do. And I will be with them right now. You know, when we talk about this question, does God have emotion? What answer are the sages really given? Let me give you a bit of an analogy. I want to share with you an interesting pattern that seems to hold when we talk about love between parent and child. Take an amoeba. An amoeba divides, and now there's two amoebas. What's the emotional connection between amoeba A and amoeba B? Not very much, right? An ant has a child. What's the emotional connection between mother ant and child ant? I imagine maybe it's a little bit more than amoeba A to amoeba B. 
A bird makes a nest, brings home food for its chicks. So you'd say mother bird to little bird, probably a little bit more connected than mother ant to little ant. Let's continue. Let's talk about humpback whales. I once brought home a documentary for my children. Nice G-rated documentary. My kids are watching and there's this scene. There are two killer whales stalking a mother humpback whale and her baby calf. The mother is willing to give up her life for her calf. She's putting herself between the calf and the killer whales. The hunt goes on for hours till finally the killer whales break through. The calf is killed. The mother proceeds ahead slowly and mournfully. My kids were like, aghast, get us out of here. This is worse than the worst horror movie. The sadness of the mother was palpable. And now imagine a human mother for a baby, for a child, do anything for a baby. It's another level of complexity and richness of love. So there's a pattern here, right? The more complex the being, the more complex and rich the feeling of love. And now take it one step further. A higher life form even than us. That would be God. Does God have no emotion? We're just no emotion we can understand. Of course God has emotion. Utterly inscrutable emotion. God possesses a richness and complexity of love, which is completely beyond us, the same way that you can't expect an ant to understand the love of a bird. You can't expect a human to understand the love of God. You can use the words love, but it doesn't do justice to the richness, the tension of an experience that's completely out of the league. God's love is the inscrutable eh, yeah, sure, eh, yeah. I will be that which I will be. Human beings can only hear a piece of that love. So God says, tell them, I will be. So I so, you know, the last thing you mentioned is uh, this notion that here's this great oppressor, there's Pharaoh and there's God. And one way that so I found that to be so powerful um, to think about that on that on those two levels, and uh, when uh, you do that, you recognize just how great God's compassion, His love, His empathy for us is. Um, that. It, it really was kind of mind blowing. I mean, I've been thinking about this passage for for quite some time, and 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 then I came across that presentation, and and, and it really made me think of uh, the that that really was helping me understand at a deeper level the words of Paul when he said, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies." or compassions, uh, I think is a better translation, and, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may, we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are, and if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. And for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. And, uh, you know the you know taking an, this understanding it, it allows us to rely on God. Uh, the there and it's funny that you know in this time period as well as I've been reflecting on this um, uh, on this passage and, and this message, uh, my son Jacob uh, gave me this this wristband that I've been wearing for I don't know four or five months now, and. One of the things on it that's it says, "I will never forsake you, um, God," and and that's uh, a reference to this passage uh, in Hebrews thirteen five. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For He said, "I will never leave you nor forsake you." So we can confidently say, "The Lord is my helper; I will not fear." What can man do to me? So here the you know the the writer of the Hebrews is 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 taking 
Now, he's quoting an Old Testament passage that we can look at in a minute, but he's applying it to a new context, a context of being able to trust God. Uh, whatever we're going through, we don't have to put confidence. We can't. There's no There's no point to putting confidence in money. Money will, riches will will fail us. Even if, you know, we, we get great, amass great amounts of wealth, it's not going to bring satisfaction or comfort. Um, even, uh, yeah, and, 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 and often it will just let you down. So instead we can be content with what we have, knowing that God is in control and will take care of us, uh, taking the lessons of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount and trusting in our heavenly father, uh, knowing that he will not leave us or forsake us. And, and he's quoting here uh, uh, the, the uh, words of, of Moses to Joshua when he said, the Lord will give them over to, um, the Lord will give them over to the people of the land and you, you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I've commanded you be strong and courageous. Do not be, do not fear or be in dread of them for the Lord, your God. It's, it is the Lord, your God, who goes with you. Yahweh, your God, who goes with you. Notice Moses, I think Moses is thinking back to that time uh, when God revealed his name to him. Because you have those two elements there together again. He will not leave you nor forsake you. So it's in that, in that context. Uh, and it continues, then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord, it is Yahweh who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor for, or forsake you. So do not fear or be dismayed. He will be with you. Here, Moses is saying, imach. He will be with you. He's using that same like third person phrase that gets modified ever so slightly to, to become uh, God's name. And he's, he's, he's making that statement. He will be with you. So uh, I see places like this pop up um, over and over again. Um, and What's that that image of the Lord going before you brings back that beautiful image of in Exodus 13 as the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. And at night, a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So that that uh, image of God's presence, God being with his people, it, it, it's so powerful. And. Uh, you know that the the first ayah that comes after the Torah uh, was God. Now, so Moses made those that statement to God. Well, God reiterates it in Joshua one uh, after Moses died. Um, God said, "Moses in verse two, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving them to the people of Israel." Every, and he lists the places in verse, skipping to verse five. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, uh, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land I swore to the fathers to give them. Um, and jumping down to verse 9, have I not, have I not, Commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for Yahweh, your God, is with you wherever you go. It's it's just reiterated again and again. Um, and so that's what allows us to, you know, to have that confidence that God's not going to leave us. Uh, that promise is carried forth into the, into the New Testament and applied to the body of Christ. And, and that phrase, you know, what can man do to me? That, that, that confidence, the confidence of knowing God is with you is the confidence that, that David had in, in that passage uh, that, where he said uh, to, to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, because of Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, 
you're not able to, to f- go against this Philistine and fight with him, for you're but a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. For Now, up to that point, you might think, oh, is David just being confident here in himself? No, because he said, for he, Goliath, has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me, Yahweh, Think of the meaning of that name, the one who is with us. He delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and Yahweh be with you. So it's it's there again and again and again um, in uh, in these passages. And it's just, I, I think it's, it's exciting. Um, there's a, you know, another another uh, imp- kind of powerful thing. I'll just uh, th- take real quick to say that those three forms of 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 um, the word that have to do with God was and God's being and and God will be. Uh, those three words in Hebrew. Notice that if you overlay them on top of one another, you get you get God's name, Yahweh. And, and I think that's what's the, the point of um, in Revelation 4, with the four living creatures with the six wings full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, is Yahweh, God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You know, God's presence with his people has promised to be there is something in the past we can look back on and have confidence in. And it's something that we have currently in our present need. And it's something we can rely on for the future. Um, God is with us. And like father, like son, the second thing on my bracelet that Jacob gave me um, comes from Matthew 28, when when Jesus brought the disciples to, uh, to the mountain and... Um, Skipping to verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them name in, the fa- in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with us too. Um, and we made the point before that that is actually the meaning um, well, and, and the meaning, the power and the meaning of, of Jesus' name as well is again emphasizing this message that Immanuel, uh, that Imach with you becomes with us in the name Immanuel. Im, Anu is we, her us, El, God. God is with us. Jesus' life and his salvation that he wrought for his people through God sending him, that is, is, a, is a gift from God that teaches us that God is with us, even to the point of rescuing us like Moses rescued the people from Egypt. God, God rescues us from sin and death through Jesus. God is with us. So thank you uh, for what at times I'm sure maybe is a little bit of a technical uh presentation when I get into some of the Hebrew things there. And, and definitely, I know uh, Rabbi Foreman's reading in, in Hebrew didn't help too many of us, but um, the message hopefully uh, came through that that God is with us in our sufferings and our trials. Uh, he is with his people and his compassion and his empathy for us is, is just unknowable. 